you're dealing with is a red dot or a blue square, okay? And so what you're aiming to do is to find the plane, or the in this case, it's a line that separates the uh, class plus one from the class minus one. And so that line is gonna be defined by a slope, which is X and an intercept, which is beta. Okay, so you can, you can write that as an optimization problem by defining a loss function. And you can choose the loss function to be in such a way that each term of the loss function corresponding to the AJ, YJ pair is zero when this condition is satisfied, when one of these two conditions is satisfied. In other words, when you're on the right side of the hyperplane defined by X and beta, then that makes this um, loss function zero because this quantity here will be negative, okay? On the, other, in the other hand, on the other hand, if you're on the wrong side of the line, this quantity is going to be um, a positive. And so you're going to incur a loss. It's going to make a positive contribution to this objective function. And so writing this as an optimization problem, if you minimize this over X and beta, hopefully it will give you the line that comes as close as possible to dividing these two classes of points from each other. So that all the plus one points are on one side, all the minus one points are on the other side. Now there's some tricks you can play with this. You can add a regularization term. When you do that, it'll tend to give you the, the line which is sort of maximally separated from the two sets of points. So in this picture here, you can see that I can actually find a line that neatly divides the two sets of points, but it's not necessarily the best line. Right, because you remember what I said that often the training data that we're working with is only a sample from the, some unknown true data distribution. So the true data in this case might be these two blobs, the pink blob and the blue blob. And all we've got is to, to work with are these samples, okay, which are the blue squares and the red dots. So our strategy, if we don't know, if all we've got to work with are these samples, it's sort of a common sense thing to do that if, if I've got many different ways I can choose the separating plane. Let's choose the one that's as far apart as possible from all of the dots. So this one is a, an example of the sort of line we want. You can see that this line, the minimum distance of the dots to the line is much larger than it is for this line here. Because here, some of the dots are almost on the line. And there turn out to be, of course, good statistical reasons to do that that gives you the best chance of separating the two actual distributions from each other, even though you don't know what those distributions are, all you've got to work with are these samples. The other thing to note is that almost always the, the two sets of points you're working with, you're not gonna be able to divide them neatly, like I showed in that earlier example. Often there'll be some overlap. But still, if you minimize this objective that I talked about here, it will still tend to give you a line that does a pretty good job at separating these two sets of points. So you can see in this picture, this line is still pretty good. There are a few points that are on the wrong side, okay? But most of them, uh, you know, it's pretty much as good as you're gonna get, okay? All right, so there's an extension of this idea. This brings us to application 10. And this is a, this idea of kernel SVM. It dates back to, I guess, the early 90s. So it's now about 30 years old. But when I started uh, taking an interest in machine learning was, I guess, the late 90s. So it was still kind of the, it was the, the modern thing then. But the basic idea is that you want to lift um, the feature vector. Sorry about that. Try to get rid of that. All right. Oh, there we go. Okay. You can, you can lift the feature vector into some higher dimensional space. So you can take the vector of features AJ. You can combine the elements of it. You can take weird functions of it, polynomials, uh, trigonometric functions, exponentials, whatever you like. Um, and you can, you can possibly extend it to be a much larger feature vector. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, you might have a situation like this where the different classes are all kind of mashed together. But if you do some sort of a transformation on the, uh, in this case, on the two-dimensional vectors, you might be able to lift them into a three or four dimensional space where you can define a nice separating hyperplane. Okay, and th so that's the idea of this transformation side. And then you can just run that SVM, which is exactly what I just did. You can define exactly the same loss function. The only difference being that now you're working with psi of AJ instead of AJ itself. And now you've got a much better chance of, um, of uh, 
being able to neatly separate the two classes. In fact, there's a famous paper by Rahimi and Recht that won a, a Test of Time Award in, uh, I think it was published in uh, Europe's in 2008, where they just said, if you just take random combinations of the components of AJ, that's pretty much good enough. Uh, almost certainly you'll be able to find a hyperplane that separates the data. It was a little bit more fancy what they said, but that, you know, that's kind of the gist of it. Random features is enough. Now, this is really interesting because this leads us to uh, be able to use uh, duality. If you look at this problem hard enough, you can sort of see that you could write it as a quadratic program. Now you have to introduce some extra variables to do that, but it's basically a quadratic program in X and beta. Okay, if I sort of introduce some, some variables to represent this max and so on. So you can take the dual of that quadratic program and you end up with another quadratic program, which is this one here. Now, what are the, let me explain the different elements of this, uh, of this QP. The unknown turns out to be the Lagrange multipliers for the constraint uh, defined by this max term. So each component of alpha, there's one alpha J for each of these terms in the primal loss function. And it basically corresponds to a Lagrangian multiplier for the constraint that pops out of that term when you reformulate it uh, appropriately. And the coefficient uh, matrix Q, which is the quadratic term in this dual LP, it turns out that you get the KL element of Q by taking an inner product of the psi of AK with the psi of uh, AL, okay? And then multiplying by YK and YL. So you basically take just inner products of these lifted feature vectors. Now it turns out you can form this LP without ever actually working with, with psi. And this was the insight that these people had. They call it the kernel trick, okay? It's not really a trick. It's, you know, it's all very rigorous. It's, it's, it's hardcore optimization really. But they said, look, you don't need to know psi. All you need to be able to do is to form this matrix Q by evaluating at one element at a time at a time using a so-called kernel function. And so what they do is they define K, the kernel function K, they never actually work with the psi explicitly because as long as you know a kernel function, you can formulate this uh, quadratic program, you can solve it and you can use it to recover, essentially recover X and uh, beta for, for the primal problem, okay? Without ever actually knowing psi. So they define the, the, the kappa, for example, let's say, uh, sorry, K of A and B, it's often some sort of weighted uh, exponential. So it's like uh, E to the minus A, A minus B, two norm squared divided by some scaling factor, let's say kappa. Okay, oh, I better not call it that, let's call it beta or something. Okay, so they, they just define the kernel using that, they define the dual LP. And that's enough to, to do the separation, but in a higher dimensional space than the data actually lives in. Okay, so that was number 10. That, and that kind of ruled the roost for, I guess, I guess about 10 or 15 years in machine learning. Uh, people came up with very uh, fancy optimization algorithms to solve this problem, or sometimes the original primal problem. So from the you know, late, mid to late 90s through um, uh, you know, about 2010, when uh, neural nets became all, started to become all the rage, uh, this was you know, maybe the primary technique in machine learning. Okay, logistic regression. Um, so in multi-class logistic regression, in, in here we're dealing with the case where you don't just have two cases that you're trying to classify, you've got M cases, okay? And um, where M could be very large, as I said at the start, M, you could be working with a collection of images and so M could be the number of different objects that you see in his images. So it could be in the thousands. So the game here is that um, uh, given an AJ and a label YJ, which tells you which object is in that image, you want to define a bunch of odds functions, PI, that tell you the probability of AJ belonging to class I, okay? And it turns out you can parameterize PI. Remember I said the functions or the mapping that you're trying to solve for, you can you find some way to parameterize it in terms of a vector X. Well, here there's not just a single vector X, there's a whole bunch of vectors X, I, where I goes from one up to M. And you define the X, I's in such a way that when a, uh, AJ actually does belong to class I, you want this odds function to be close to one, okay? 
And when AJ does not belong to class L, say, you want the odds function to be close to zero. Now you can see by the way the odds function is defined, it's always between zero and one. Okay, just by the way it's defined. But you wanna choose these vectors so that for you know as many as possible of the uh, I, data items in the training set, this property holds. That it tells you, it gives you odds of close to one when um, uh, the AJ is actually in uh, the class I that corresponds to PI. Now you can write down a loss function. You can write that down as an optimization problem by defining this thing called an R posteriori log likelihood function. And you can write that just by taking these odds and sort of arranging them in a certain way. Um, and uh, yeah, and you end up with this thing here. Notice this X of YJ, the YJ remember is a, is a label uh, from this class one to M. So this picks out the, the correct label corresponding to uh, AJ and puts it in the numerator. And then the denominator is just the sum of everything else evaluated at AJ, okay? Now, uh, this, uh, this function is called a softmax. It shows up a lot in, in ML. Uh, basically, when they really want to work with a max function, but they don't like to do that because it's discontinuous or non-smooth, they prefer to work with a softmax because it's sort of smooth. So it's a little bit of a cop-out, but uh, it's ubiquitous. Often the last layer of a neural network, as we'll see, is a softmax function that looks somewhat like this. In fact, you can kind of think of the neural net as a process of taking the feature vectors, feeding them through the network, popping out at the second last layer. And the second last layer you can think of as being kind of the transformed version of the, of the raw features. And then doing say a softmax or multi-class logistic regression at the last layer. But we'll come to that later. Okay, here's another problem that I'm not gonna say much about, community detection and graphs. So here, remember I said last night, we had a problem uh, that were finding the inverse sparse covariance over a network. And I said that networks were a really big area of study in machine learning. Well, here's another one that's studied a lot. Um, when you've got a network with a bunch of arcs in it or a graph with a bunch of arcs in it, you might wanna look for communities. So communities are subgraphs where the likelihood of the, them being connected to each other in the same subgraph is much higher than them being connected to something in another subgraph. So if you look at this, it, it's not very hard to see that you can sort of neatly split this one into two communities where you know the, these guys are pretty richly connected, these guys are pretty richly connected, but the connections between them aren't that, uh, aren't that powerful. So I had a bunch of slides on this, but um, uh, I don't have time to explain the formulation, but what they usually do is assume that the probability of being connected uh, within your community is P, and the probability of being connected outside your community is Q, of having an arc to a, um, uh, to a node outside your community is Q, which is somewhat lower. And provided there's a significant distinction between P and Q, um, there are algorithms that can fairly reliably uh, partition these into two pieces. Okay, adversarial machine learning. This got really big, um, I guess, starting in 2013. It's continued to be a pretty rich area. It's, I guess it's died off a little bit lately, but for a few years, uh, there were tons of papers coming out in this area. And this might be a picture that you've seen a lot too. The story here is that if you train a, um, uh, if, if you train a neural net uh, on a collection of images, um, if you run it long enough, it can just determine with pretty good confidence that uh, this picture here is a panda. Well, it's only 57% confidence, but I think the state of the art's got a lot, a lot better since then. But what these guys discovered, and it was subsequently backed up with many, many, in many other contexts, was that if you add a little bit of noise to that picture and run it through the same neural net, the same trained neural net, it will say with 99% confidence that's a, that it's a gibbon. Now, this can't be random noise. It looks like random noise, but it's not. If you add on a random perturbation, um, uh, and by the way, this is a very small perturbation. This is multiplied by epsilon. So that's why this picture looks exactly the same as this. In fact, they're a little bit different, but in ways that you can't see with the naked eye. But as I was saying, if you just add a little bit of random noise onto that, usually you won't uh, change the label. Usually the neural net will still think it's a panda. Uh, 
So you have to be very careful about the, the noise that you're adding on. Uh, random perturbations are usually okay, but small, carefully chosen perturbations are enough to cause it to misclassify. And so a lot of issues are thrown up here. Uh, one is, uh, first of all, uh, can you choose these perturbations uh, in some sort of efficient way? Is there some systematic way that you can come up with very small perturbations that will cause a network to misclassify? Uh, secondly, can you train a neural net in a way that makes it more robust to perturbations of this kind? Okay. Now, the, the reason that this is a problem is that very often you've got training data points like this, and your, your decision boundary, which is sort of like the hyperplane, but more general, this is a decision boundary. Things on one side of this boundary are pandas, things on the other side are gibbons. The problem is that the decision boundary comes very close to some of the data points usually. So if you make random perturbations, you'll usually not change the label. You'll just be staying on the same side of the decision boundary. But if you make a perturbation in a slightly wrong direction, it's gonna make you cross the boundary, okay? Now you might say, well, in 2D, there's a lot of directions I could choose here that would make you cross the boundary. But let me just point out that geometry in high dimensions is nothing like two dimensions. If we extend this idea into million dimensional space or billion dimensional space, um, you can have something that's very close to the boundary, but 99.999999% uh, of the time, a random perturbation will not make you cross the boundary. So high dimensional geometry is, uh, is weird. Okay, so, but the question is, can we still train the network in a way that sort of pushes it, pushes the points further away from the decision boundary? And another thing we might be interested in is, can we verify that the network is going to be uh, robust to all perturbations of a given size? Can I come up with some kind of guarantee that uh, every point is further away than, say, epsilon from a decision boundary? So you can use... Uh, mixed integer programming for that. There was a paper from 2017 uh, by Madri and his group at MIT where they actually used mixed integer programming to solve that problem, but it was very, very expensive to do. Okay, the question of finding adversarial perturbations, it turns out you can use a little bit of uh, optimization there. I think I might have to skip this though because uh, I don't want to uh, dwell on this too long, but it turns out if, it, if, if the decision boundary is defined by some function, uh, let's call it J here, you can actually just do a steepest descent in J to take you towards the boundary. That's the inside here. So you can use a scale steepest descent direction in this function that defines a decision boundary to figure out what the worst perturbation is. So that, in some cases at least, is not so hard. As for training for robustness, as I said, if you want to train in such a way that not only the point AJ is on the right side of the boundary, but everything that's an epsilon perturbation of AJ is also on the right side of the boundary, then what you're working with is a function like this. You're working with the max of H, where H is kind of the loss function corresponding to the Jth term or the Jth item of data. Uh, you wanna not just minimize H of AJ, YJ and X, but now you wanna, you wanna minimize H in, where AJ is now anywhere in some unit ball of, of radius epsilon, okay? So you want to max. Sorry, you want to you, you want to work with the biggest uh, value of h in that in that ball of radius epsilon. The ball could be defined in any norm that you like. And so the problem of minimizing uh, to find the uh, maximum classifier, whatever you want, it now becomes the min max problem, because instead of just minimizing over this over the sum of these guys, you're now minimizing a bunch of these max functions. Okay. And so people did, uh, people did this in, uh, I guess, five years ago or so. There were a bunch of papers on how do you solve this problem efficiently? You can use subgradient methods. You can, uh, you can use uh, algorithms that actually generate points that are kind of on the wrong side of the boundary and add them to the training set. There are all kinds of ways of doing that. Um, and we actually have a paper on, uh, on data adding from about four years ago, I guess. Um, as for this question of verification, that is, that's the question of, can you guarantee that, that the network will not only classify all the points correctly, but classify everything in a ball around each point correctly? Um, it turns out that networks tend to be more robust. They tend to be more robust to perturbations if they're sparse. And so this motivated a little bit of a boom in, training to in trying to train neural networks so that the 
connections between the layers were sparse. Well, I've got some pictures in a few slides that kind of illustrate what neural nets look like. And generally in convolutional neural nets, every neuron in one layer is connected to every neuron in the next layer. But if you train it in such a way that only a few uh, of those weights, uh, those connections are actually active, those uh, networks tend to be uh, uh, more robust to adversarial perturbations. And there are other things you can do. You can promote what's called ReLU stability and so on. But if you're really interested in this, there was a very nice tutorial uh, presented by two of the experts in the field, presented at Europe's in 2018 at that website that I recommend if you want to know more. Okay, something similar here is uh, called dist distributionally robust learning. This is very closely related to adversarial machine learning, but it sort of takes a different perspective. It sort of goes back to this idea that, as I mentioned this earlier today, that what you'd really like to do is to minimize the loss function over all the data in the underlying uh, true data set, which I'll call P. So P describes the true data set, the distribution of A and Y, and you know, together with probabilities, okay? So this is what you'd really like to do is to minimize this expectation over the true data set. But the thing is, we don't know what the true data set is. All we've got to work with are a sample of points from the true data set, this sample of M training points. So the, the viewpoint that distributionally robust learning takes is, well, let's use that sample to define what we call an empirical approximation. So this is a distribution that I'll call PM, and PM is a spike distribution. It's got these delta spikes at each of these uh, uh, particular training points. So PM just has M spikes and it's zero everywhere else, okay? So what we'll do is, is uh, we'll say, let's assume that our, er that our empirical uh, approximation PM is close to the true distribution P in some metric, okay? In some metric that measures distance between distributions. So we'll call that metric D. It measures the distance between two distributions and you can measure that in several different ways. So instead of minimizing over P, which is what we'd really like to do, what we'll minimize is over the worst case among all the distributions that are within an epsilon radius of the empirical distribution, which we know, okay? So we know the PM defined by the training data. We'll pick an epsilon and we'll say, let's look at the worst case of this expected value function for all the distributions within epsilon of PM. And let's choose the uh, a classifier or regressor or whatever it is to minimize the max over that ball. This is a distributionally robust idea. Okay, so I have a recent paper on this with Nam Ho Nguyen, who's in the business school at University of Sydney, might even be on this call. Um, sorry, I can't see all the, the list of participants. Um, but we have a recent paper showing that in certain cases, you can actually formulate this min-max problem in a nice tractable way. Okay, so we showed that if you choose the H, the loss function, to be a particularly nasty one, that is to be the zero one loss function, that's, sorry, it's the other way around, the function that's, um, that has the value one when you misclassify the point and zero when you correctly classify the point. Okay, so it's a discontinuous function. If you plug that function into this uh, DRO formulation, you actually get something very nice. You get this ramp loss function. So instead of being a step function like this, it becomes this sort of gentle ramp, okay? And you get something, and here's, and you get this regularization term added on. The epsilon here is the radius of the ball of distributions that we're considering. You get something that you can still minimize using optimization, okay? It's non-convex, but it turns out not to be too bad in certain situations. Okay. Uh, in fact, we've sort of done a bit more uh, work on that. Uh, I've done, I have another paper with uh, several colleagues here in Madison where we showed that um, uh, if you've got a linear classifier, uh, you can measure the distance between distributions in either a Wasserstein metric or, uh, or a divergence metric. Sorry, as you can see, my LaTeX is faulty there, a divergence metric. And you can write it as a generalized, what we call a generalized linear program. This looks like an LP, except that X can belong to a polyhedral set and there's an extra regularization term here, which is pretty straightforward. So we, we show how to formulate um, uh, problems where 
um, the H is a convex function of this, uh, of this YA transpose X. And uh, whether you use a Wasserstein metric or a divergence metric, you get a problem of this form, which you can solve using your favorite large scale um, convex method. Okay, and the last thing, uh, this isn't really an application, but it's kind of a, a framework that we can put a lot of these earlier applications into, uh, a so-called convex concave min-max problem. And the problem we deal with here looks like this. We define this function L, and it's a function of two, two variables, L, X and Y, which both have you know, potentially enormous number of elements. There's a, what's called a bilinear term here that joins the two, X and Y together, but then there's an extra term involving a bunch of convex functions of Y, of the components of Y, and another convex function of X. Now this HJ star is what we call a convex conjugate of another function HJ, another scalar function. Now, the reason this is interesting is you can put a lot of cool problems into this form. So any problem of, that looks like this, you can actually write it in this form here. And this problem shows up a lot. In fact, least squares has this form where the H is just a sum of squares. Uh, L1 regression has this form. Hinge loss, which is a function that we use in SVM has this form. Uh, the G function, if we define that to be a two norm, we get Tikhonov regularization. For one norm, we get lasso. Um, we can also do more uh, fancy forms of regularization. We can do log logistic regression, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we can even do a DRO, uh, distributionally robust optimization using this model. So this is a very flexible framework, a very useful framework. And uh, I have a couple of recent papers with uh, colleagues here in Madison on uh, algorithms for solving large scale versions of that problem. And in the next lecture, I'll just mention um, what we've done in that regard. Okay, so here's the one issue I wanna talk just a little bit about, this idea of benign non-convexity. So uh, several of the, or quite a few of the applications that I point out actually give rise to non-convex uh, machine learning problems. But for years and years, people in machine learning, when they talk and write about optimization, and do research, they only really dealt with convex problems. And con convex problems still have their use. There's still a lot of convex applications, but increasingly now um, there, uh, you know, there are more and more interesting applications that are non-convex, including training of neural networks. That's definitely a non-convex problem. So uh, a guy called Ju Sun, I only found out about this in the last few months, has been maintaining this excellent web page where he keeps track of all the interesting applications of non-convexity in machine learning. And I checked it out again uh, on Sunday and it, uh, it's gotten very long. He's got, it's quite a big page with pointers to many, many uh, works to literature. Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, when we um, uh, studied, well, at least when I studied optimization, uh, we basically were told that non-convex problems, if you wanted a global minimum of a non-convex problem, that was just super hard to do um, because in general, those problems are extremely difficult. But it turns out that a lot of these ML problems have special characteristics so that despite the non-convexity, they're still relatively easy to solve. So they might have properties like the following. Some of them have properties that all local minima, there are a bunch of different local minima, but all local minima are actually global minima. They all have the same value of the objective. So any one of them might be fine as a solution to your problem. They might also have this a property that all saddle points are actually strict saddle points. So by that, I mean that they've got zero gradient, but they've actually got a direction of negative curvature. If you look at the Hessian and take a, a direction corresponding to a negative eigenvalue of the Hessian and move in that direction, it will cause the function to go downhill, okay? So that's a nice property to have. Uh, and another property that's very common is that you can initialize the algorithm in such a way that you can find an initial starting point that's close to the, to, to the, to the global minimizer, okay? So there are principal ways of initializing the method so that it will actually converge to the global minimizer using some naive algorithm like steepest descent. So these are sort of typical properties that show up in these benignly non-convex problems. So here's a very simple example, and I really don't, have a lot of time to uh, go over this. So I might, I, I, I can give you the slide deck so you can study these things in more detail later on. But this is going back to application three where we had matrix sensing, where the matrix X actually had low rank. Uh, 
And I'll assume in this case that it's also symmetric just for simplicity, although the same idea works for the non-symmetric case. So we act Z with its own transpose. And that's a non-convex problem. This is a non-convex problem here. But it turns out that if these observation operators, AJ, if they have a certain property called restricted isometry, um, then this turns out to be a benignly non-convex problem. Now this property, it's a little bit hard to explain, but basically it's as though AJ was an orthogonal, the collection of AJs was like an orthonormal matrix, okay, like an orthonormal operator. In other words, all of the AJs were distinctively different, almost orthogonal to each other, and they sample a good fraction of, of X, okay? So this is um, the property that you need. So for any X that has rank at most Q, where Q is bigger than R, uh, if you've got this property holding for any such X, it satisfies this restricted isometry. So for that subclass of problems with that very special property, you can show that all the local minima of this function are actually global. You can show that all the stationary points, that is all the points with zero gradient, actually have a direction of negative curvature in the Hessian. So it's easy to escape from those points using any kind of reasonable algorithm. And not only that, there's a very cute way to initialize the method. You can form, you can take all the AJ operators that define these observation operators, uh, curly AJ. You can take a linear combination of them using the YJs, which are these observations here, and take an SVD of that and take its leading R eigenvalues. Okay, and if you do that um, and just run steepest descent, you'll find the solution. Now, proving all of this is, uh, is complicated. Uh, if you take the dual of this, it starts to make sense. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, just one example among many of a problem that is definitely non-convex, but under certain assumptions, it's non-convex in a sort of benign way. This, we can still efficiently find solutions. Okay, so the last uh, uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk a little bit about neural nets and the other speakers later this week are gonna say more about this. So uh, I think their perspectives are gonna be uh, uh, complementary to what I'll talk about here. There's so many different angles to neural nets that you could uh, literally talk about them for years and without really repeating yourself. But here's a, a diagram of uh, what's called a convolutional neural net. So what goes into the bottom of this network might be a vector AJ, a feature vector. So each of those red circles would correspond to one component of AJ. And then you move through the network. What happens as you move through the network? Well, the output of each of these nodes gets a weight gets applied to each output. So each of these arcs corresponds to a scalar weight. And I gather all those weights together into a matrix WL. Okay, that WL are all the weights in layer L. So this would be layer, I guess, one here. Okay, so you multiply all the output of the previous layer with, with weights. You might add on some offset as well. And then you get the input to the next layer by summing up all the incoming arcs to, to that node. Okay, so essentially you're applying a linear transformation from the output of one layer to get you to the input of the next layer. Then within the layer, you do a component-wise transformation that I've defined by sigma here. So within this node, you do the sigma operation that maps a scalar to a scalar. And nowadays, the sigma that everyone seems to use is the so-called ReLU operation. You simply take the input. If it's negative, you set the output to zero. If it's positive, you just set the output to the input. Okay, that's the ReLU function, just the max of t and zero. And you repeat that process. You don't just do it for one layer. You take the output of this layer and feed it into another layer and so on. You keep going all the way to the end. What comes out the top very often is a set of probabilities. So you could have coming out the top uh, something to do with the probability that AJ belongs to one of five classes, for example. Okay. Or it might be something else that can be converted into probabilities. Okay. So that's the basic idea that, and as I said, this is a convolutional neural net. There are many, many variations on neural networks where the architecture, the way that the different layers are connected is, is uh, very different. 
Uh, you might go off into different branches of the neural net and then they might join up again. All kinds of weird things can happen. You can have some sort of local aggregation, some sort of limited connectivity. You can have uh, instances where weights are shared across different arcs in the network. A very uh, common thing uh, for the last five years or so has been ResNets. In ResNets, you get connections that actually skip across layers so that the output of this layer doesn't just go into the next layer, but also the one after that directly. So it's a lot of interesting variations like that. There are also these LSTM uh, networks. So many variations. I've just shown you the most basic one. Okay, so you can write training of neural nets as an optimization problem. And it looks a lot like a lot of the other problems that we've been working with in these earlier applications. Again, you've got, you've got a bunch of feature vectors as inputs. You've got a bunch of labels as outputs. Um, the unknowns here, the vector X contains all of the weights in the neural net. So all of the weights defining these transformations define between layers are uh, agglomerated, conceptually at least, into this unknown vector X, okay? And again, you've got a loss function here that tells you how close is the output of the neural net to the desired label YJ, all right? So you want H to be zero. Typically, you want H to be zero if the output of the neural net when you input AJ is actually YJ. Otherwise, you want H to be something positive, okay? And so the game is, you want to minimize this loss function summed over all the training examples. In other words, you want to choose all of these weights on all of the arcs in the network to make this loss function as close to zero as possible. Okay. Now, in modern neural networks, very often the total number of components in X is vastly bigger than the number of data points, which is M. Okay. And this is a phenomenon known as overparameterization. So very often you've got, you know, uh, hundreds or thousands or even more, a factor of hundreds or thousands or even more uh, times as many weights as there are training points. So there's an awful lot of function approximation power in the neural net, more than you need to perfectly fit the data, okay? Uh, and yet it turns out that adding extra weight seems to make um, the neural net easier to train. Uh, in other words, it seems to make it easier to find the minimum. And it also doesn't hurt you for generalizability, as we'll say, talk a little bit about in a moment. Now, the, what are the properties of this loss function L? It's certainly nonlinear. It's actually non-smooth. If you've got this transformation going on at every node, that introduces non-smoothness because this function looks like this. It's got a kink in it when t equals zero. Okay, that's where the non-smoothness comes from. And the whole thing is non-convex because you're sort of uh, uh, composing uh, all of these different linear plus or piecewise linear maps. Uh, so you get something uh, uh, very nasty and yet applying very naive optimization techniques, gradient type techniques to this often gives very good results. Uh, nowadays there are all, a ton of different software packages available for training neural nets. A lot of them are customized to run on GPUs, graphical processing units. Uh, which are very fast architectures that can do sort of restricted uh, precision operations very quickly. Um, and so it's pretty easy using one of these languages to define the architecture that you want to work with, uh, to give it the training data, uh, tell it what uh, step length you want to use, and just let it go. And, uh, uh, you know, it makes, it makes the business of training neural nets from a programming point of view very simple. The amount of computation you need might be absolutely enormous but conceptually at least it's easy to program okay how do we train these things well let's ignore for the moment the non-smoothness let's pretend that l is a smooth function um we can't really practically find a gradient of l we can't even evaluate l and the reason for that is that the number of terms in the sum uh, is absolutely is often absolutely uh, humongous it could be millions or billions and not only that, but the, the dimension of X is huge. So to evaluate this sum, what you've got to do is to feed every data point into the neural net, make it undergo all the transformations in the neural net, evaluate its output, and then compare it with YJ. And doing that for every item of the training set turns out to be just um, computationally uh, way more than your uh, far too big a price to pay. 
So you can't evaluate L, you can't evaluate grad L for the same reason, because you're gonna to have to run through all the terms in the sum. So what do people do instead? Well, they use this uh, idea called stochastic gradient or SGD. So SGD is the workhorse of machine learning. It's by far these days, the um, if you look at all algorithms running on all computers in the world and uh, figure out what you know fraction of compute time uh, at any given moment is running SGD, compared with all other possible programs, SGD would absolutely dominate everything else. When I was um, uh, you know, learning optimization 30 years ago, we were told that simplex method was the algorithm that dominated all other computations, but nowadays it's definitely SGD. So uh, you know, their entire uh, data centers that had just spent all their time uh, running SGDs to train neural nets, for example, on image data coming from self-driving cars. So what does SGD do? It doesn't try to evaluate the entire gradient. It doesn't try to look at every term in the sum. It samples what's called a mini batch. Uh, well, I've called it batch here, but it's, a, it's actually more commonly known as a mini batch. Um, so it takes some number of terms randomly sampled from the total number of terms in the sum. It might be a hundred, it might be a thousand, something like that. And it evaluates the gradient as the average just over those terms in the sum. So you can show that this is, if you choose the, the batch randomly, this is an unbiased approximation to the gradient. So you can show that the expectation of GK is in fact the true, the true gradient of L evaluated at XK. Okay, assuming everything's differentiable. Um, and so you just take a step in that direction. Here it is here. You just up, it's like a steepest descent step, but it uses this approximate gradient. There are all kinds of variations on this. You might want to do something like uh, Nestor acceleration, where you add on a momentum term. Um, uh, the way that you choose the alpha K, there are entire teams of people at the big uh, data companies that are trying to figure out new heuristics to choose the alpha Ks. Um, that's a big issue. But basically, this is the algorithm that they're all, they're all running. Now, the business of calculating gradients, it turns out that there's an awful lot of structure in, this fun in these functions, H, obviously, because they result from this very sort of um, structured transformation of the data. And so you can calculate the gradients in a very structured way. And I think this is something I'm gonna have to skip over because I'm a little bit short on time, but I believe um, uh, either Tong or uh, Guo Yin are gonna talk about this later in the week. Um, you can sort of think in the conv conv convolutional neural net you can think of h of x as being a function that's a composition of a whole bunch of functions, each of which corresponds to a single layer. So for example, at layer L minus one, you're taking the output of the previous layer, which is uh, L layer L minus two, and you're operating on that with the weights between layer L minus two and L minus one, and that's captured by x of L minus one. And that same structure holds true all the way down, okay? So using that structure, you can come up with a very efficient way of evaluating the gradient of, of X with respect to the weights in all the layers. So if I, if I evaluate uh, eight, the gradient with respect to the weights in the last layer, the second last layer, the third last layer, and so on, you can see that certain terms keep recurring. So here's an example. This term here is a matrix. It's the partial derivative of the output of layer L minus one with respect to uh, layer L minus two that term appears uh, a couple of times here, okay? This term appears three times. And in fact, you've got all of this commonality in these different expressions that you can exploit in this algorithm called backpropagation. It wasn't a new idea. This idea had been around forever. I used to work with uh, people doing a data assimilation and weather modeling, and they had this idea of using a joints, which is basically exactly the same idea. It's also known as, uh, reverse mode automatic differentiation, um, more prosaically known as the chain rule. It really is just an application, clever application of the chain rule. Okay, let me say a little bit about overparameterization. I've already mentioned that in typical neural nets these days, the total number of weights exceeds the number of data items. I've mentioned here factors of 10 to 100 you can actually get much bigger than that. You know, 1,000, 10,000 or whatever. These, these uh, neural nets are, these days are massive. There's, uh, I saw a talk by Misha Belkin where he's, you're now talking about neural nets with, uh, with trillions of parameters, which is what ten to the, uh, ten to the twelve, 
four to 10 to the 12 parameters. And they take an enormous amount of time to train. So in fact, there's so much approximation power in those neural nets that if you run stochastic gradient long enough, and it might, have, it might be a very long time, you're actually able to uh, exactly fit the data. And so as I mentioned yesterday, this phenomenon used to be known as overfitting. And we used to be told that that was a bad thing to do. But what's been observed in neural nets is if you keep running them well, below, well uh, beyond the point where they've already perfectly fit the data, um, they often generalize well. That is, if you give it another piece of data that's similar to the data you've trained on, but not the same, they'll often make very good predictions of the, um, of the output of the corresponding label. And so that's one question, why isn't overfitting happening? And the second question is why is stochastic gradient or any gradient method finding the global minimum of this very non-smooth, non-convex function L? You know, this very nasty function L. If you run it long enough, it's going to the global minimum. Why are these things happening? And uh, these things are only partly understood. There's been a lot of very interesting theory, some of it verified empirically in experiments but none of them tells the whole story yet. Uh, typically things have only been proved for sort of simplified neural nets that might only have one layer of neurons or something like that. But here's when, one very interesting thing that I mentioned last night when Nadia asked the question. And let me just go over this very quickly again. I know I'm uh, getting a little short on time, um, but uh, uh, this is a double descent phenomenon due to Belkin. Uh, people claim that you know similar ideas have been around before, but the idea here is that traditionally, we, when we've increased the number of parameters in the model, which you can think of the x-axis as being, um, and train it, we can we can sort of train it according to this dotted line. As I increase the number of parameters, eventually the model becomes rich enough that I can perfectly fit the training data. But what I'm more interested in is the so-called test data. I want to see how that trained neural net performs using data that looks like the training data, but is a little bit different. And what we typically see is this U-shaped curve, where there's a sort of an optimal point where we stop adding parameters to the model. Because beyond that point, the model's sort of overfitting the training data. So there's sort of, there was always this uh, question of where do you stop here? Where do you stop making the model complex? But what's been observed recently is that if you continue to train beyond that point, Magically, often the interpolation or the, the, uh, the generalization error comes down as well. And so why is that? Well, you can sort of explain it by the fact that, as I mentioned last night, when you get into this regime with, with, which is overparameterized, you've got many different solutions and all of which perfectly fit the, data, the training data, okay? And from those, you wanna pick the solutions that also generalize well. And it turns out that these algorithms like stochastic gradient, magically, they're sort of attracted to the solutions that seem to generalize well, okay? And the reason why that's the case is still really not fully understood, all right? So that's the idea, I've kind of explained this here. This is, there's an explanation, there's a very nice review paper of Belkin in Acta Numerica that I was the uh, editor for. So I reviewed it very closely where he explains this phenomenon, where he explains why overfitting doesn't, doesn't contradict classical theory. Classical theory basically assumes that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of taking the worst case among all the interpolating models. Whereas uh, uh, double descent, this double descent idea takes the best case among all these interpolating models. And then this idea of, there's a so-called implicit regularization or inductive bias. These are terms used to say that uh, stochastic gradient is going to a nice solution. Okay, so one explanation for this, it is pretty solid, is that as you add parameters to the model, as I, as I keep saying, the, the number of solutions grows. In fact, you can sort of plot a manifold of solutions. I've got a picture here, very conceptual, but the blue curve is all the possible solutions that will perfectly fit the data, okay? So, any one of those solutions will perfectly fit the data, but not all of them will generalize well. But what, they, what this means is that if I choose an initial point somewhere in this space, say this red dot here, then by just applying stochastic gradient, I will, and by taking very short steps, I will tend to go to a solution on this blue line that's very close to where I started. And this has actually been observed, this actually happens. And so people have shown that if you choose not just a random point, 
but a random point that's close to zero. In other words, all the weights are very small in the neural net. If you choose a point like that, it will tend to go to a solution where all the weights are still pretty small and they also have a good generalization property, okay? That's very loosely speaking. It's still a little bit subject to dispute, but that's one explanation. I was gonna say a bit about neurotangent kernels, but I'm re I really am running out of time here. I might come back to that if I get a chance later on, but I mentioned something last night and I wanna close with that. This idea of uh, these terms called catapult, which Belkin told me about a couple of weeks ago. That's you to Belkin as well. These, are, these are terms, uh, grokking and slingshot, that came up in a paper that just came out last month. And they made this very interesting observation that, uh, uh, yeah, I guess I'll just close with this. These are two pictures from that paper, that if you train a, uh, a neural net to almost zero loss, okay, you've seen almost all the examples, it basically works almost perfectly on all of them, Occasionally, it will stumble across an example that it doesn't yet work on. And so you'll suddenly see the objective function spike, okay? You'll see these spikes happen. And, and then something seems to happen. It seems to jump the weights into a different regime. And this purple line here illustrate, well, now I've overwritten it and made a big mess of it, but this purple line on the graph uh, illustrates what's happening to the norm of the last layer in the neural net. And you can see each time there's a spike, it's moving this norm to a different level, okay? So it's doing something major to the weights. Meanwhile, what's happening to the generalization error? Well, you've got this collection of validation data that you're not training on. You're just using it to test the quality of the, of the, uh, of the net. That continues to come down. So in other words, even though you've almost trained to almost zero loss, you're down here at the level of 10 to the minus eight in the training loss, you're still getting these spikes every so often when you stumble across a point that's not yet correctly classified. And those spikes are doing something. They're somehow moving your weights into a different regime that is somehow improving the, uh, uh, the quality of the solution, the generalization qualities of a solution. So they call this slingshot, slingshot, because it's taking into a different regime. I'm not really sure what grokking means. I think it's just kind of, you know, looking around different parts of the solution space. So this is an observation that's only been made empirically. Um, there's some speculation as to why it might be doing something good. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is just one example of many different kind of areas of speculation and activity that's going on in neural nets. A lot of it's centered around this question of, you know, why are we finding uh, these two questions that I asked back here? Why aren't we overfitting? And why are we able to find the global minimum? Okay. So I think I better stop there because I'm already past time. I'm really sorry for going over time. Um, but if you want to stick around, I'm happy to answer questions.